Now we have our first keynote speaker who's going to inspire you and get everybody uh, sort of energized for what's to come for the rest of the day. So please welcome Matthew Griffin, founder and CEO of the 311 Institute. Thank you very much. So how are you all this morning? Is it early? No. See, I was up at 5 a.m., so it feels like lunchtime for me. That's it. But that's just, uh, I'm used to getting up at that, uh, that time in the morning because I have kids. So as we start talking about sustainability, how many of you this morning had a coffee? Okay. How many of you thought, where did that coffee come from? This is just little, this is a futurist game, frankly. Um, so a lot of coffee is grown in South America and out in Africa. Uh, recently, a startup in the US produced a molecular coffee. So it's type of a synthetic type of coffee. They put it through trials and tests against a popular chain, so Starbucks, basically and most people selected that one. Um, so coffee without the coffee bean. Now, if you think about the sustainability and the environmental footprint that is associated with your cup of coffee in the morning, technology has a way to, shall we say, put things back in balance. Now, from my perspective, I'm a futurist. Uh, I'm also a strategic advisor. So from a futurist perspective, I go zero to 20 years out. So if you're a multinational organization, typically you're going up to 20 years. But let's face it, most organizations go between five and 10 years. Uh, if you're a government, though, I go 20 to 50 years out. Because if you're a sovereign government, and I work with all G7 governments and four prime ministers and a bunch of other people, Frankly, you're sort of more interested typically on 2030 out. So if you're talking about the future of infrastructure, transportation, healthcare, welfare, state, jobs, skills, employment, universal basic income, and all these kinds of things that we talk, in, we talk about in Europe, typically you're sort of going a little bit further out. But um, my background is I'm actually a park ranger. I'm a marine biologist and oceanographer. I've not always been a technologist. So... I'm actually very thankful for being able to give this speech because I think it's timely. I work with a whole variety of different organisations and on the one hand as a futurist, when I started my own journey, the one thing I didn't really think I was going to be able to do was change basically how global organisations think about the future, how they shape out their sustainability and diversity messages or any of these kinds of things. And uh, thankfully, I was wrong. So today, I work with organizations like Accenture, so we talk about the digital future. Um, I was with them a couple of weeks ago, and if you're going to an Accenture event next week, I'll be there. Uh, Area 2071, this is where the UAE government are trying to build Dubai or turn Dubai into the world's happiest city. It's in the year 2071 because that's their centenary. We have Airbus, who are building out the future of electric flying cars. We have organizations like Centrica. Centrica are increasingly embracing renewable energy. They're selling off their generation assets because increasingly we can see a way for energy to, on the one hand, drive down to zero when it comes down to cost. Um, but the rise of renewables are fundamentally changing the game. We have Denton's, basically with robo lawyers. So Denton's are the world's largest law firms. Uh, Huawei, if you work with Huawei or Samsung, or if you have a Huawei or Samsung device, I've helped design the next 20 years of those things. Uh, GEMS Education, so increasingly when we have a look at the crazy future, and I'll take you through it, um, there's an impact basically on your children, because we all see the future coming. And then Microsoft, future of artificial intelligence, and legal in general. Legal in general are one of the world's top 20 global asset managers and as a shareholder, they're able to, should we say, encourage organizations to promote the right behaviors. So again, sustainability and diversity are sort of key there. T-Mobile, future of 5G. So from my perspective, what I'm going to show you is just literally the little grain of sand in the desert. There is a huge amount to discuss when it comes to the future. So if you want to go to the website, you can download this. There are 180 emerging technologies, basically, in here. If you want to understand the impact of each one of them, basically, on individual industries and everything else, you can do it in about two minutes. Because the one thing that is inherently unsettling about the future is, on the one hand, it seems to be getting faster, but everything also seems to be getting more complex. So I'll try and simplify some of this. And these are the little cards. You literally read them and you can figure out where these technologies are from a regulatory perspective and adoption perspective and all sorts of things. So I picked up the Accountancy 2018 uh, brochure. 
and this came to mind. In fact, this was in it. So today, basically, I actually think that when we have a look at investment managers, when we have a look at the accountancy profession, frankly, you have the opportunity to be the superheroes of your own industry, but also of every other industry. Because let's face it, money talks. I've been into many CEOs and had conversations where a CEO said, we're happy with the business status quo because we are the biggest animal on the block. We don't want to disrupt our core business. Think oil and gas giants. They don't want to disrupt their core business because it's profitable. So as accountants, especially you have a privileged position where you're able to go into organizations and present them with a different point of view, a point of view based on the balance sheet. And hopefully that aligns basically with sustainability and diversity and everything else. Basically, so we have a variety of different levers that we can use basically when we're encouraging organisations to do the right thing. But hopefully they do the right thing because. Now, in this particular one, the reason that this, that this caught my attention is when we talk about hunter-killer robots, firstly, they're actually here. We have fully autonomous hunter-killer robots thanks to organisations like Lockheed Martin. It's called a fully autonomous kill chain. The United Nations last year was due to have a debate on hunter-killer robots and banning them. But, um, and this could be legend, but this is what was reported at the time. At the time, I see the United Nations debate on banning hunter-killer robots didn't take place because the Brazilian delegation had a query with the previous year's expenses. And so they hadn't paid. So as a consequence, the debate on hunter-killer robots didn't take place because, frankly, Brazil seemed to have a couple of queries about who pays for the donuts. So again, expenses, money. But uh, how many of you feel that today we are moving faster than we did 10 years ago? Hands up. Most of you. In the balance of fairness, how many of you think that we're moving slower today than we did 10 years ago, as, an, as, as organizations, individuals, as society, as business, whatever it happens to be? Anyone think slower? No. Part of the reason for that is we have a huge number of technologies coming through. If I asked you what you could do next year with technology that you couldn't do this year with technology, and I was in the 1980s, you'd look at the computing power and you typically think, well, computers are getting more powerful, so I can ingest more information, analyze more information, and with that, I can do more things. Data as a service, whatever it happens to be. Today, though, we live in a fundamentally different place, basically, where I'm saying to you, are you digitizing your business? Are you moving your business to the cloud? What else could you do with ne next year with technology? Are you embracing augmented reality, virtual reality, robotics? Artificial intelligence, are you doing anything with the blockchain? And all of a sudden, we've gone from you're trying to get your head around one type of technology and the impact that that has on your industry as well as the industries that you serve and every other industry. And then when you start combining these different technologies together, you get some insanely powerful things. You take gene editing, you take a gene edited bacteria, put it into a solar panel, you have a path to a solar panel that can, is 50% efficient. The energy industry has never, ever considered genetic engineering, basically, as a way to solve the global climate crisis. From a digitization perspective as well, consider this. As we all become more connected, as we digitize products and services, and we, as we digitize different things, from an adoption perspective, and you'll have seen this lots and lots of times, it took 75 years for the telephone to be adopted by 50 million people. Pokemon Go was adopted by 50 million new users in 19 days. Call of Duty was adopted by 100 million users in seven days. So at what point, as all of your different industries digitize, at what point do we start seeing a multi-billion dollar company built in a day, where they build their product, they push it out, and all of a sudden, you have a billion people downloading it, or 100 million, or whatever it happens to be. Increasingly, we are getting to the point where we can disrupt entire industries at global scale faster than ever before. And again, you now have this added challenge of trying to get your head around everything that's going on 
but increasingly the window of time that you have to get your head around things, to try to understand the impact of X and Y and Z on ABC is also compacting. And so we end up in this kind of mentally furious state. However, as we start talking about digitization, from a sustainability perspective, there are a lot of benefits. If I asked you, for example, about 10 years ago, or even five or six years ago, to go and sit in the middle of a field, and I say, right, I'm going to come back in about an hour. I want you to tell me what you've done in that hour. Ten years ago, I said, I would have likely come back to you and sit when you were sitting in that field and said, what did you do? And you would have said, well, I watched the butterflies, I saw some, a flock of birds fly over, and I lay in the sun. Particularly in sunny Belgium, right? Um, however, if I do that today, you can say, well, I spoke to my friend in Australia. The cost of, tech, of things is coming down. I spoke to my friend in Australia via video call. I ordered a pizza and it was delivered by drone. I took an online learning course on YouTube and I now know about artificial intelligence or something. Um, I sorted out a couple of contracts. I also did a health check because when you start combining artificial intelligence with the sensors in these things, these little supercomputers that we have in our pocket, we can do some amazing things. So if I take artificial intelligence while I'm in the middle of my field and I combine AI basically with the accelerometer, accelerometer on my smartphone and I do this, I'm checking myself for coronary heart disease. If I talk into the microphone on this thing, I'm checking myself for dementia, depression, mental illness. If I look like I'm taking a selfie and I combine AI with the camera, if I look like I'm taking a selfie, all of a sudden, basically, I'm checking myself for pancreatic cancer. Because when you get pancreatic cancer, your eyes turn slightly yellow. I can check myself for skin cancer. So the effect that all of these digital and disruptive technologies have on our society is fundamentally, these technologies are increasingly democratized. Do you want access to the most powerful artificial intelligence on the planet? Go to Google, put your credit card in, or download it for free. Secondly, they decentralize everything. So primary healthcare in the middle of a field. You can stick those technologies into a phone from Samsung, for example, sell those phones basically to 300 million Africans, and you now give them access to some form of healthcare that they never had before. So we can do a whole variety of things, but it also reduces the cost of individual products and services. I just did a health check on stage in about a minute. That technology is going into cubes that are in Dubai and America and all sorts of different places. So digital technology has got a lot of benefits. However, it also has a cost. So there's two technologies represented here, and these are both underpinning our new digital world. On the right-hand side, the blue line, we have blockchain. On the left-hand side, we have artificial intelligence. So the left-hand curve is the amount of petaflops that it's taking to train artificial intelligence today. Not the whole bag, train artificial intelligence. As you can see, I mean, AI is an old technology anyway, but as you can see, kind of around 2010 to today, that line is pretty much vertical. We're now at the point basically, where a global supercomputer called Summit sits around here. So as you can see, these models are getting more and more complex. They're getting more and more compute and energy intensive to train. It's only going one way. From a blockchain perspective, blockchain really sort of emerged in the late sort of, well, sort of early 2010s. That line's almost vertical. Bitcoin, the digital currency, represents 80% of that energy. So from an energy perspective, blockchain is now consuming six gigawatts of electricity, which is the equivalent to Sweden. So on the one hand, digital basically allows us to do things remotely. If we digitize a product or service, we either no longer have to travel to buy it, we no longer have to manufacture it or use physical product, so there are benefits to digital. But the cost of digital is increasingly this. And these lines are going vertical, and they're going vertical fast. However, 
So if you have a look at artificial intelligence, in the past seven years, the amount of compute power that we need to get gains in AI has increased by 300,000 fold. The amount of electricity that we're using to train artificial intelligence is doubling every 3.4 months. With this kind of line, it's going to get to the point where it doubles almost every day, let alone every 3.4 months. And then from a blockchain perspective, blockchain is now consuming just about 0.3% of global electricity supply. And then that's over 19 times the amount of global solar capacity or, 59, or 56 times the amount of hydro capacity. That's unsustainable by anyone's measure. However, we do have a couple of technologies coming through that can help us kind of fix this problem. So now we move into the optimistic piece. Firstly, we have intelligence processing units that will let us train artificial intelligences 100 times faster with 90% less energy. They're the future of GPUs, which are what we currently use. We have new lean artificial intelligence models that are based on human-like memory, which simply use a lot less compute power to train. We also have neuromorphic computers. So neuromorphic computers, for example, will cram the power of a so supercomputer, so something like the US Department of Energy Summit, which is a petaflop computer, into the size of a fingernail. But it will pack that amount of power into the size of a fingernail, but you can power that thing with a AA battery. So we have paths. From a blockchain perspective, it's always going to chew up a lot of electricity, unless you move to this one but we've got renewable energy coming through. So 60%, 60, 67% of all electricity today on the planet is generated using fossil fuels. Um, we can move to renewables. We have mineless blockchains. Mineless blockchains use a type of technology called proof of authority. They don't use the electricity intensive hashing algorithms that, uh, that's creating this chart here. And uh, we have these types of technologies coming through from Microsoft on the bottom. So on the one hand, basically digitization is allowing us to improve this planet's sustainability. But on the other hand, what it gives, it takes away somewhere else. But we do have solutions. However, when we talk about the pace of change, there aren't just the couple of technologies I mentioned earlier. There are over 400 exponential technologies. There are 180 exponential technologies, basically, on this starburst. Each individual technology on this starburst can either change one industry or all of them, irrevocably. Disruption from the inside out. So I'll give you a quick example. I won't go through it, but this is in the codex. Uh, for example, 3D bioprinting, actually we do holographic printing. 3D holographic printing, um, you have, if you have a vat of liquid and you use light, then a company like Adidas can manufacture trainers in the back of a store in about two nanoseconds. So that one technology eliminates all of the inventory for retailers, also eliminates all of the manufacturing in China, also eliminates the need to ship products around the world. And it's really cheap. So holographic printing. Um, when we start talking about things like bioreactors, I'll come on to that. Bioreactors fundamentally, well, actually, I'll, I'll leave that a little surprise for later. Bioreactors do something quite cool. Um, We've got flexible electronics. Basically, when we have a look at the computing side of things, we've got liquid computers coming through. If you, uh, if you use Microsoft Azure Cloud, basically then in 2020, you'll be able to start storing information in DNA. So we have DNA computers and biological computers coming through. China are already on the world's fifth generation biological computer where they took a, a video file, saved it to a bacteria, and replayed it. Um, and we've got quantum computing coming through. Quantum computers need super cooling, so they're not particularly environmentally friendly at the moment, but they're 100 million times faster than today's computing platforms. We have nuclear batteries. We have quark energy coming through. Structural batteries. If you want to, so structural batteries are down here. If you want to eliminate all of the lithium ion batteries, basically within all of today's electric vehicles, Structural batteries will do that because we can turn the shell of the car into the battery. 
So we talked about, on the one hand, we move to electric vehicles. Everyone goes, fantastic, and we're no longer burning fossil fuels. But then the other problem, I sat down with the CEO of Volkswagen a little while ago, the other problem is, well, what do we do with all this lithium-ion batteries? And then we also have calcium batteries coming through. Polymers, for example, so polymer batteries. Um, a polymer battery will charge an electric vehicle to a 400-mile range, basically within about 10 seconds. And you can have biodegradable, biodegradable polymers. So there's all sorts of things. Creative machines, I'll discuss that. Uh, but you go around the wheel, you kind of get the idea. Every single, and every single technology has got a addressable market opportunity of about half a trillion dollars. The little dots are when they mature. Um, and then if you want, I want a really fun one, hive minds. If you connect lots and lots of different devices together and you plug them into the cloud and you fuel them with artificial intelligence, they can all talk to one another. It's a hive mind. So Google, for example, produced a bunch of robots. You train one robot one thing, and the, it teaches the rest of the fleet. Same with autonomous cars and everything else. We've also turned, given rats hive minds as well. So this stuff eventually comes to humans. It's getting closer. Um, we, gave, we connected two rats on two different continents, gave them a hive mind, and they were able to, one learnt a maze, and the other one navigated its way around the maze, basically having never ever seen it before. So there's crazy stuff. So as I say, what I'm going to show you is just the grain of sand. Uh, however, how many of you believe in magic? As uh, Arthur C. Clarke said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. How many of you, when you came into this room, thought... It's amazing. Artificial suns. Hands up. How many of you came into the room, looked at the lights, and thought, that's amazing technology. Artificial suns. None of you, because you're used to it. But 200 years ago, whatever it happened to be, basically, that would have been a completely different story. Let alone, basically, this. So, I'm going to fast forward to you, to you to the future, and then we're going to come back a little bit. Um, how many of you have ever seen a genuine living hologram, a proper one, like the Princess Leia holograms? Yeah. So this is the world's first free-to-air, 3D living hologram. It does not use glass. It does not use augmented reality. This is the real deal. If you watch science fiction movies like Blade Runner, where they have this sort of 70-foot dancing holographic ballerina, this is the granddaddy of that. But remember, technology gets bigger, better, faster, cheaper. So today, this is this big, tomorrow it's that big, then it's that big, then it's that big, then the devices that generate it, basically, which are currently this big, start getting more and more compact. Basically, the technology gets better, the technology gets more ubiquitous, it becomes more off the shelf, it becomes cheaper, and then you're buying it basically from your local retailer. This is done using femto lasers, by the way. You can interact with them in all sorts of things. Um, how many of you got children as we talk about the Fast and Furious future? This is a fun Christmas present. How many of you would like to stream your children's minds to YouTube in real time? Yeah, hands up. How many? Yeah, yeah, see, look, no one's putting their hand up, right? Well, if you take some digital technologies, so we take artificial intelligence, we take a skull cap. Once the artificial intelligence has learned brainwave patterns, you can do this. So what we have here is we have a bunch of volunteers that are looking at the shape on the left-hand side, and the artificial intelligence is decoding those brainwave images in real time, taking information from billions of human synapses to produce pictures. This is already being used in healthcare, but if it looks grainy, that's because it is. Three years ago, you couldn't do this. Fast forward three years, and you'll be able to live stream much higher quality movies, basically from people's heads. Don't bother telling people what you did on holiday, just plug in basically to the machine and show them. And the Russians actually have that, which is rather, rather freaky. But as you can see, it just keep, it keeps going. But again, the pace of technology is accelerating. So let's move on to sustainability. So what we have today basically is we increasingly seem to have a runaway planet, basically where we have more people consuming more resources than ever before. 
And despite our best, our best climate change attempts, everything looks like it's going south. So we now have creative machines that can create and innovate products. What if you could come up with thousands of options for a single design without drawing, all of which meet specific goals set by the designer? And from those options, pick the one design that delivers on the most important criteria, the design you couldn't possibly have imagined. This is generative design, a technology that promises massive computing power, creating forms with precise amounts of material only when needed, achieving maximum performance while wasting nothing. The generative design can be about much more than simply turning on alternatives. Prototypes can be scanned and equipped with sensors that provide real-time performance data that can be moved back into the design process so the object, in effect, co-designs itself. And depending on the material and method the manufacturer chosen, the software can optimize the design for those choices. The things that limited us in the past, software, materials, manufacturing, no longer do so. The generative design, the world can look and perform any way you want to. This is the next stage in the evolution of design, and it's happening now. So on the one hand, basically, that is about a type of technology called a creative machine that helps you design products that use the minimum amount of material to get the performance and the results that you want, whether it's a chair, whether it's a rover, or whatever it happens to be. And I'll give you a little insight into that in a moment. However, these machines at the moment basically are capable of iterative innovation. So you take a wireframe model of a drone, basically you put it into an artificial intelligence and you tell, it, you tell the AI that you want to create a drone using the minimal amount of material that has got these reliability and performance characteristics. The AI basically will do tens of thousands of simulations a second and it will come up with the perfect drone. And then you just pick one and you can 3D print it off in the back. Eventually, over the next couple of years, these will get to primary innovation, then disruptive innovation, basically, where they're doing the thinking, they're understanding basically, the problems to solve, basically, and they are starting to run things through. So we already have these machines that are starting to create new compounds, new healthcare drugs, and all kinds of stuff at a very basic level. In Australia, basically, they used one of the machines to create a flu vaccine, which has now gone to human trials, and it's better than anything else that, we could have, uh, that the Australians have come up with. Um, however... If your children are being taught robotics, because robotics are the future, um, what about this one? They're not being taught this. So what we do is increasingly we can take a product, whatever the product is, doesn't matter whether it's carpet, chair, cars, we can put sensors into those products, we can give those products a task. This is from the University of Nor Norway. This robot was tasked with moving from one side of the floor to the other side, and it had sensors in it information about its movement as fast as possible. Information about its movement is fed back to an artificial intelligence that runs thousands of simulations to try to create robot version number two that can move from one side of the floor to the other side of the floor as quickly as possible. A human would be able to do this, but it takes a couple of months. The AI is here. It's a lean artificial intelligence. We're not talking supercompute power. The AI designs the robot and then sends that design to a 3D printer. We don't have to send it to China any longer or whatever it happens to be. The 3D printer prints it off using the minimal amount of material, So, which, by the way, 3D printers themselves cut out about 80% of waste, uh, let alone anything else, and they allow you to create tailored products on demand and all sorts of things. But if you swap the 3D printer for a 4D printer, where 4D is time, and we did this with MIT two years ago, what you have is you have a self-evolving robot that can print itself, so manufacture itself, and walk off the printer. If your children are being taught robotics today, this is a field called evolutionary robotics. This is advancing very, very quickly. That's a whole conversation in itself. However, back to sustainability. These things are so good that General Motors recently used a creative machine to shave off 50,000 pounds of weight from its cars. NASA, when, a when Autodesk went to NASA basically with the technology and said, look, we think we have a better way to help you design lunar rovers, NASA went, well, frankly, the only thing we really care about is weight. 
because we take a heavy thing, we put it into a rocket, we shoot the rocket into the sky, and the heavier that thing is, the more expensive it is for us to, to launch it. Um, and they said, the only way that we're going to be interested in anything that you have to say is if you can cut 20% off the weight of our lunar rovers. Um, and frankly, we have a bun we've got hundreds of PhDs, basically from Jet Propulsion Lab, basically, who have been doing this for years, and they are the experts, so go away. And they sent Autodesk away with a flea in their ear. Autodesk came back two weeks later and uh, said, we think we have something. NASA said, have you saved 20% of the weight off of our rovers? And Autodesk went, no. I said, well, why are you here? Doors over there, go away. Autodesk said, no, we've shaved off 30%. This is the standard way that NASA is now designing its rockets, rovers, and everything else. If you fly on an Airbus, by the way, Airbus have also picked up on this because in the A380, they're using these same technologies to create things like partitions that are 98% lighter with 98-ish percent less material, but with the same performance and durability characteristics. Under Armour, if you go onto an Under Armour's website and you look for the Architect sneaker, it's $300. It was designed by an artificial intelligence. But because everything gets faster, Under Armour used to take 18 months to come up with a trainer, so the idea for a trainer, and then put it onto the shelf. You get an artificial intelligence to design the trainer in about a day. You 3D print the trainer off in the back of an Under Armour store. You've now just designed a trainer in two days. Time from product con concept to shelf, from 18 months to two days, everything gets faster. However, how many of you, since we talk about climate change, how many of you would like a pathway to eliminating 70% of global greenhouse gas emissions? Or how many of you would like it to be sunnier here? Yeah, yeah that's it, see? Okay, so... Very quickly, I said that bioreactors at the start basically were a game-changing technology. If you listen to the United Nations, in 2050, we will have wars over food because there will be 11 billion people. We don't have enough land. We could breed super cows. Basically, we could genetically engineer crops, and then we've got climate disaster coming. What we can do here is we can take the stem cell from an animal. It can be anything. Um, so here's a weird one. Uh, so you can take it from traditional animals, so cows, chickens, turkeys, all that kind of stuff, or you could take it from a zebra. You put that, or a tuna or a salmon, you take that cell and you put it into a bioreactor. We are making history right now. You solve global famine with this and one technology. We're taking the first step into creating a world where everyone has access to fresh, healthy, delicious, and sustainable seafood. We're proud to announce the world's first clean fish ever to be eaten. This means fish produced entirely without cruelty. Not just dolphin safe, but fish safe as well. Are you ready? Yeah. Fish is known as one of the most healthy sources of protein on the planet, and we're eating more and more of it every day. Up to 90% of the world's fisheries are overexploited or depleted. Contaminants like mercury, plastic, Growth hormones and antibiotics are increasingly making their way into our favorite foods. We knew there had to be a way to produce seafood without causing the harm that it does now. We're looking at the biochemical process that happens inside of a fish and making it happen outside of the fish in order to produce the same seafood that people love to eat. What they've done is they started with nothing and they built themselves a whole technological platform to make food in a way that just hasn't been done before. Seeing that come to fruition today, was an extremely moving experience. And I think also an important one uh, in terms of how we need to be seen. Why did you choose to farm or fish wild fish from the way environmental and human health costs where you could just have it made by Thinless Foods? At Thinless Foods, we're on a mission to revolutionize the way seafood is made. So you can eat, now eat fish without the need to catch fish. If you apply this to cattle, and we have a bunch of companies doing that, China just bought $300 million, basically, of what we call clean meat. Cattle contribute 20% of all greenhouse gas emissions. Plus, we give the, we give the people the, uh, the land back. Communications, everyone and everything, basically, is being connected. So we have 12,000 low Earth orbit satellites going up into space now. The other three and a half billion people on the planet that aren't connected today will be connected within the next 10 years. 
That either doubles your, total, your customer's total addressable market opportunities, but it also means that some of the problems that we see with digitization either accelerate, um, so we need new solutions, but then similarly, a lot of the digitization of products, like the digitization of food, basically can now proliferate much, much faster. Uh, construction. So on the one hand, construction, uh, concrete, uh, contributes about 10% to global greenhouse gas emissions. If you remove Portland cement and you put in fly ash, you now have what we call green cement. You can now eliminate basically the carbon emissions associated with making Portland cement. That's 10% of global, global greenhouse gas emissions. However, so what we have is we have new ways to produce new concretes. There's loads of this stuff, but anyway. However, if we now combine that technology with 3D printing where we can only print and only make what we need, we can now start 3D printing houses. You don't need to transport basically the same type of materials to site. In Dubai, we are building an 80-story skyscraper using this technology. In France, we have people living in 3D printed homes. In Holland, they are printing a village. Down in South America, they are 3D printing an entire community in a day. So artificial intelligence can design the building, the robots can print it. The cost of 3D printing a four bedroom house is $24,000 and you can do it in eight hours. This also helps solve the global housing crisis. Energy, we all know about renewables and I won't go on about this too much, but we currently, the most solar panels that you buy from IKEA are about 17% energy efficient. The record for, for silicon-based solar panels from an efficiency perspective is 27% held by the Japanese. If you trade a silicon solar panel for a Perskovite solar panel, you get to 32% solar efficiency. If you now put bacteria into that solar panel, you get to 50%. If you put graphene on top of the solar panel, you can generate electricity from snow and rain. But then if you, if you capture the heat, the waste heat from the solar panels using a tiny technology called carbon nanotubes, which no one would pay attention to on my starburst, you can get to 80% solar efficiency. At this point, the energy revolution basically takes hold. And at this point, why would you be buying oil and gas? And the oil and gas industry basically is on a decline. Energy optimization, however, digitization again, basically if we take an artificial intelligence, basically we set that AI loose basically in a Google hyperscale data center, help it learn the patterns. Google managed to reduce the energy usage of their data centers by 20% within two weeks by turning on AI. So, now, when you have a look at energy generation, for example, 70% of greenhouse gas, well, actually, no, it's not 70%, it's, it's about 40% of global greenhouse gases come from energy generation. We have a way to get rid of that. So we move from fossil fuels, polymers, wireless charging, structural batteries, that gets rid of lithium iron. Um, we can 3D print lithium ion batteries as well, so we can increase their energy density basically without increasing their size. Printed lithium ion, by the way, means that we all of a sudden can have electric aircraft, bio batteries, where we turn bacteria into batteries. There's all sorts of electricity, there's all sorts of electricity generating things coming through. Healthcare. Digitization of healthcare. Basically, we have robots, basically like these, that are increasingly allowing us to treat people in remote areas. A robot recently performed a remote heart surgery on a, on a patient that was 30 miles away. So now, basically, if you're building a hospital, this is just in there for a bit of fun. Um, if you're building a hospital, you could literally have a staff of surgeons here delivering primary surgical healthcare to people in Africa over 5G networks or whatever it happens to be. We can 3D print human organs, so we're already 3D printing human skin, cartilage. Um, increasingly, we're 3D printing miniature hearts. So in the future, no one needs to die. If you have a heart attack, we just 3D print you a new one. This is all up and coming. The timeline at the top, basically for some of these 
artificial organs, basically it's about 2035. I'll switch that. Retail, basically, so on the one hand, retail, um, we actually have... So from a retail perspective, we can eliminate inventory. We can eliminate shipping and logistics completely. When we have a look at dyes, so this is where we use gene editing technology. If you go to India, basically there are rivers in India where when you say to people, what's this season's colours in New York? They say, red. And they know it's red because they can see all the toxic dye basically in the rivers around India. So using gene editing, basically we've now been able to genetically engineer bacteria that can produce any of the colour basically that's in your garments. So genes, basically whatever it happens to be, we have a way to, to help the uh, fashion industry become more environmentally friendly. We can also 3D print leather, just in the same way that we can 3D print buildings and everything else. The leather industry is worth about three billion a year, just in the US. However, when we start talking about 3D printing things, this is the holographic technology I was talking about earlier. Remember the impact of this. Adidas produce hundreds of millions of trainers a year. What happens if you no longer need to ship them or hold the inventory? One technology disrupts multiple industries. Transportation, basically we have Hyperloops coming through basically that travel at 700 miles an hour. They make the Eurostar that I'll be on in a moment look relatively slow. However, simply because we're here to talk a little bit about the future, these have been flight tested uh, a lot. So we have electric aircraft coming through. Um, electric aircraft and cargo ships. Cargo ships use something called bunker fuel. If you can electrify aircraft and aviation and you can electrify cargo ships, in China we have electric cargo ships. NASA, basically Rolls-Royce and Boeing now have electric aircraft, albeit small ones. You can eliminate 20% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, however, this latest technology has also been flight tested 70 times. It's less green today, but we do actually have a green version of this technology coming through. The fuel for this thing, there's a new type of green fuel for this thing that can be posted. But when we talk about the commute, basically from X, Y and Z to Brussels, how do you like that commute to be faster? This is ready for flight tests, and the first one should be rolled out in 2024. It's courtesy of SpaceX. As I say, it's not that green, just for a bit of fun.
So as a parting message, on the one hand, as a global society, we have lots of problems. As a global society, basically, when we take some of the ingenuity that we have as humans, when we create and when we really think about what we're trying to produce, particularly from a sustainability perspective, I've just quickly shown you a variety of different routes to eliminate 70% of greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions, let alone anything else like infinitely recyclable plastics, biodegradable plastics, and all the other things I could have talked about. And this is the thing. as You have the opportunity as a profession, basically, to go into your customers, basically, and have a fundamentally different conversation about the things that they can do. Because if you take from retail's example, eliminating inventory and global supply chains, what retailer wouldn't want that? So that you can produce personalized products on demand. There are real-world economic benefits associated with all of these. Renewable energy, if I stick a solar panel on your roof, I can disconnect you from the electricity grid, and your electricity is free outside of the maintenance contract for the solar panel. Yeah. In the manufacturing industry, that's about 20% of your costs cut right there. So thank you very much for your time. I hope you enjoy the, uh, the rest of the event, and uh, it's been a pleasure. Okay. <laughs>